Hi there. Uh, we're really, really glad that you are listening to this sermon um, and we pray that it will encourage you and that you will grow through it in your faith. Um, we would also like for you to follow along in your Bible because that's how this teaching resource will be most useful to you. Um, this is also not meant to be used on its own. So if you're not regularly meeting with a local church family, we really encourage you to do so. Um, and if you are ever in or near the Lorraine area, we would encourage you to pop in and visit us on a Sunday morning. We'd love to meet you. Um, also, if you would like to support the Lord's work um, in and through the Emmanuel family, um, you can visit emmanuelpe.org slash give. Hello to everybody. The reading tonight is from the book of Isaiah, chapter 4, verses 1 to 14. God's case against Israel. Hear the word of the Lord, people of Israel. For the Lord has a case against the inhabitants of the land. There is no truth, no faithful love, and no knowledge of God in the land. Cursing, lying, murder, stealing, and adultery are rampant. One act of bloodshed follows another. For this reason, the land mourns, and everyone who lives in it languishes, along with the wild animals and the birds of the sky. Even the fish of the sea disappear. But, but let no one dispute, let no one argue, for my case is against you priests. You will stumble by day, the prophet will also stumble with you by night, and I will destroy your mother. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge, because you have rejected knowledge. I will reject you from serving as my priest, since you have forgotten the law of your God. I will also forget your sons. The more they multiplied, the more they sinned against me. I will change their honour into disgrace. They feed on the sin of my people. They have an appetite for their iniquity. The same judgment will happen to both people and priests. I will punish them for their ways and repay them for their deeds. They will eat but will not be satisfied. They will be promiscuous, but will not multiply, for they have abandoned their devotion to the Lord. Promiscuity, wine, and new wine take away one's understanding. My people consult their wooden idols, and their divine rods inform them, for a spirit of promiscuity leads them astray. They act promiscuously in disobedience of their God. They sacrifice on the mountaintops, and they burn offerings on the hills and under oaks, poplars, and terebinths, because their shade is pleasant. And so your daughters act promiscuously, and your daughters-in-law commit adultery. I will not punish your daughters when they act promiscuously, or your daughter-in-law when they commit adultery, for the men themselves go off prostitutes and make sacrifices with cult prostitutes, people with art discernment, are doomed. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you to God. Now is it on? Yep. Right. Thank you, Adrian, for reading that. We are in Hosea chapter 4. We'll move into 5 as well before the end of this evening. If you've been alert this week, you will be aware that our erstwhile former president has had his day in court this week, two days, Jacob Zuma, not quite his day in court, I must admit, uh, it was his day to appeal his day in court, which I believe is coming in July. He seems to enjoy those appeals quite a bit, um, but this little didn't work out for him. 
uh, he will be back in court and the court case is going ahead. Um, and I haven't totally read up, so I'm always open to correction, but as far as I can make out, he's up specifically for tender fraud and corruption. Right, so those are the charges against him. But as I was reading around a bit this week, I became aware that if you're not South African, that, that's just one of a number of high-profile cases mm. that are going on this year. Mm. Um, just to list a few. I mean, this is just past presidents. I'm told we can expect, if we're watching the news, to see Nicolas Sarkozy, pr France's former president, on trial. Um, we can expect to see, I didn't know him, but it's uh, uh, Najib Razak of Malaysia. I apologize for my ignorance, but there was a former president of Malaysia who will also be on trial. And I believe it's a long shot for this year, but either this year or next year, the biggest one of all will possibly be Donald Trump from the US. So it's a bit of a trend at the moment. If you're former president, you need your day in court. But it does beg the question, and as I say, I'm just talking former presidents, there's a number of other big profile cases this year coming up, uh, but it begs the question, what was the biggest trial in history, the biggest high profile event, court case, trial? Mm -hmm. Hosea here in our passage tonight makes the case that this really is the biggest trial. Mm -hmm. That, that Donald and Trump and Jacob Zuma and Nicolas Sarkozy pale into insignificance compared to this particular court case that we're going to look at tonight and try and make sense of. Um, it starts there in 4.1, just the first part of it. Hear the word of the Lord, people of Israel. For the Lord has a case against the inhabitants of the land. So we want to hear the Lord. And I know we've prayed already, but I'd like to take the chance to pray as well. Um, let's hear the Lord tonight. Let's pray. Father, I thank you that we can pray to you over and over again. But there's a case being laid here against your people and I pray that we hear it and do not ignore it and dismiss it or overlook it. Amen. Mm -hmm. It's almost as if up till now we've been reading about Hosea and Goma. Mm -hmm. Hosea who wrote it, okay, and his very wayward, promiscuous Pouring wife, Goma. That's been at the forefront. But it's been a kind of veneer, a very thin veneer. We've been aware all the time that, that while it's about Hosea and Goma, it, it's about more than that. It's about way more than that. That Hosea has been instructed by the Lord to behave in a certain way to his wife as a reflection of him. But tonight he, he casts that veneer aside. He, he really plunges in here and, and really gets the heart, heart of the issue he has. That case, um, that, that word case in our version, hear the word of the Lord, people of Israel, for the Lord has a case against the inhabitants of the land. That word in the Hebrew is rib. It can be translated in a number of different ways. It can be translated case, uh, controversy, cause, complaint, dispute. I think we get the picture. The Lord is saying he has a dispute. He's declaring it. He's putting it out there. He is not happy. In fact, the rest of the Bible would describe it as wrath. Mm. But the interesting thing, and let's not overlook it, the case is not against the heathen, the wicked guys round about, 
those guys out there, you know those guys. You know them. In Hosea's day, you know, it wasn't against Sodom or Gomorrah. That would have been a little bit in his history. It wasn't against Assyria or Babylon. And those were frightened nations. And their tactics left a lot to be desired. They're the kind of people who should stand before God. They're horrors. They really were, if you do a little bit of history reading as to how they treated the people they defeated. They're the kind of peace people that you expect that God would have a case against. And we know from Jonah that at one stage he did have a case against Assyria. But that's not what's on the cards. The case is against the people of Israel. It's just their basic. These are his people. His people. These are the people that, that he rescued out of slavery in Egypt. Using great powerful acts that demonstrated his majesty and his authority over other gods. He rescued them, brought them out of slavery, led them through a desert. Gave them a law which shaped them into a people, a recognizable people that still today we can recognize. He then led them into a land, a promised land, a place for a kingdom under his rule. Time and time and time again he acted on their behalf. He gave them identity. And still today, you will meet a Jew. Who's proud of his identity. Proud of who he is. And that was all God. These are the people he's got a case against. It carries on. I didn't finish that verse. Hear the word of the people of Israel. For the Lord has a case against the inhabitants of the land. You guys that I know so well, my case is against you. There is no truth, no faithful love, and no knowledge of God in the land. None. There is no knowledge of God. Very briefly, I want to unpack those three. We can just get a context. The first one is that issue of truth. There's no truth. None. Another translation would be faithfulness. You often come across that in the Bible. There's no faithfulness in the land. We could go back to Joshua. Now Joshua, if you like, was, was the leader that led Israel into the promised land. The second leader of the constituted nation of Israel, first was Moses, and when Moses died, Joshua took and Joshua eventually died. But his kind of parting shot to Israel, his last will and testament, that thing that I never want you to forget. I can imagine him on his bed. And this is what he says to the nation of Israel. Therefore, fear the Lord and worship him in sincerity and truth. Of all the things that Joshua could tell the nation, it's there. In sincerity and truth. Israel, don't forget this. Because this is the nature of your God. He is a God of truth. Don't forget that. Truth counts. Especially when you're a child. The second one is steadfast love. There's no steadfast love in the land. Now there's lots that can be said about this. For, for the sake of brevity tonight, I found a very quick quote of what we might understand from steadfast love in a commentary. It includes all love of one to another. Mm. A lover, a love issuing in acts. It includes loving kindness, 
and piety to parents, natural affection, forgiveness, tenderness, beneficence, mercy, goodness. Of this, there was nothing. This land, the land of Israel, God's people. What a hard, cruel place it had become. There was no steadfast love. And this too is a characteristic of God. Our God, the God of Israel, is a God of truth and a God of steadfast love. And he's saying, my people, you don't even represent me anymore. I don't see myself in you. I put you together. I shaped you. And I can't see me in you. And the last one. There's no knowledge of God. No knowledge of me. My case against you is that you do not know me. You do not. No wonder there's no truth. No wonder there's no steadfast love. These are things you would learn from me. But you don't even know me. You don't know me. It's not a surprise when you come to verse 2. Cursing, lying, murder, Stealing and adultery are rampant. One act of bloodshed follows another. This is my case against you. From this point onwards, he makes three arguments against this nation. Mm -hmm. They are worth hearing. As he says up front, hear the word of the Lord. So let's hear these three arguments. The first one is in verses 4 to 6. I'll read it. But let no one dispute, let no one argue, for my case is against you priests. You will stumble by day. The prophet will also stumble with you by night, and I'll destroy your mother. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge, because you have rejected knowledge. Mm -hmm. I'll reject you from serving as my priest. Since you have forgotten the Lord your God, I'll also forget your sins. This first argument is an argument against the religious authorities of the day. He'll move on from them shortly, but he starts there. They have no knowledge of God. The priests have failed in their primary duty. I'll give you a brief trip back to Leviticus, where Moses tasked the priests to understand what they were meant to be. They are to be holy to their God and not profane the name of their Lord. The food, sorry, let me read that again. They are to be holy to their God and not profane the name of their God. For they present the fire offerings to the Lord, the food of their God, and they must be holy. They must be holy. There really is very little chance for the land if the representatives of God, those set apart to represent God, man to God, God to man. We're talking about the priests and the prophets. Everywhere you look, the people who should know don't know. They don't know. Now, I think sometimes we're very quick to criticize the priests. But before we move on, I just want to remind us, us in this room, We're not Israel. But this is what Peter had to say to us. You are sitting here. 
are a chosen race. A royal priesthood. A holy nation. A people for his possession so that you may proclaim the praises of the one who called you out of darkness into his marvelous life. The priests in Israel represented God to their own people. We, as a royal priesthood, represent God to the nations. We were called out of darkness into His glorious light for a purpose, for a reason. People will not have the knowledge of God without us. The question is, are we proclaiming the excellencies of Him who called us? Before we point fingers at Israel, before we point fingers at the priests, before we point fingers at anyone else, are we surprised if the world we live in has no knowledge of this God? Argument number two against this nation. And this now is directed at the people. I'm going to read from verses 7 to 9. The more they multiplied, the people, the sons of the people, the more they multiplied, the more they sinned against me. I will change their honor into disgrace. They feed on the sin of my people. They have an appetite for their iniquity. The same judgment will happen to both people and priests. I'll punish them for their ways and repay them for their deeds. I apologize a moment, but this isn't working for me. There we go. <laughs> I should be good at this by now. Is that affecting the screen? No. Okay. I'm constantly having to bring it up. These other people are so, so short to my life. <laughs> That's my patience with people shorter than me. <laughs> right. Back to this. The people have an appetite for sin. Let's not think this is a neutral, equal opportunity moment. The people have an appetite, a hunger, a craving. That's what they want. Their eyes are big with sin. Let's have a look at verse 12. My people consult their wooden idols and their divining rods inform them, inform them. For a spirit of promiscuity leads them astray. They act promiscuously in disobedience to their God. Think about it. Hedged in there. At the start is the words my people. Should I say, are the words my people. The end are the words their God. This is a people unique in the world where God has revealed himself to them and said, I am your God. I am. I, I, I'm yours. I am your God. And they consult in wooden idols. They look for to be informed by divine ones. They knew where to look. They knew who to consult with. They were a people because God had made them that way. And it's like, they're going to go and look for the answers anywhere but there. We're not going to look there. We don't want to look there. We want to look elsewhere. We want to look out there for the answers. Saying, I, I'm the one who gives you the answers. No, I, I want to look over there for the answers. I want to look there. The spirit of promiscuity leads them astray. They will go after sin. They will hunger for it. They will pursue it. They'll lust after it. They'll lust after anything that is not God. Mm -hmm. Let's define it like that. If, if it's not God, they want it. That's it. Doesn't matter what it is. If it's not of God, that's the thing I want. 
That's the thing I want. What? An indictment. I say no wonder. There was cursing, lying, murder, stealing, and adultery. It was rampant in the nation of Israel. God's people. One act of bloodshed follows another. Again, before we move on, I want to just remind you, before we point fingers at Israel, which, may I say, all through the centuries, fingers have been pointed at Israel. Mm -hmm. Paul says to us, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All. That's what makes this case the biggest in history. He makes the case to his people, a nation. But the case hasn't changed. The nation is much bigger now. We've been adopted into it. If you are a follower of Jesus Christ, you, you have been adopted into the nation of Israel, the nation of God. We are sons and daughters of this God. And Paul says to us, I still have this case against you. The third argument he makes before I become to judgment Lovely word. It's not a four letter word, but I think some people count it as a four letter word. The third argument against Israel is that they lead others astray. Just a little bit of background. I've been talking about Israel up to now, which is that nation that was rescued out of Egypt, out of slavery, was constituted into a nation, was led firstly by Moses, then by Joshua, into the promised land and became Israel in the land of Israel. That's what I've been talking about. But in reality, when we come to Hosea, it's no longer one nation. It's two nations. There's the northern kingdom, which is now called Israel. Sometimes it's called Ephraim. All right? Ephraim was the largest tribe in that northern kingdom. Okay, it's a bit like calling our country uh, Pretoria because the executive's there. Or Cape Town because the legislature's there. Alright, Ephraim was the largest one there. So we have our northern kingdom with ten tribes. And Hosea's judgment is mostly directed at them. But then down in the south you have a smaller kingdom, just two tribes, Judah. Those are the two kingdoms. But, but the behavior of the northern kingdom is such that it's a temptation for Judah to join them. You can see this in verse 15. Israel, if you act promiscu uh, promiscuously, don't let Judah become guilty. Do not go to Gilgal or make a pilgrimage to Bethaven. And do not swear an oath as the Lord lives. Just a couple of terms there. It mentions Beth Aben and Gilgal, places that could go and worship. There is no Beth Aben, as far as the historians can make up. There's no such place. Beth means house. And we do know of a place called Bethel, still today. That word is used often. There's a church now, Bethel. So you have that place we know about. But we don't know about Beth Aven. Aven means wickedness. House of wickedness. And it seems most likely that that is a kind of snide remark to make about it. I don't know if you remember when the new number plates, they're not so new anymore, they're old now, came out and you had all the 
the letters for the provinces, you've got EC here, you have GP for Gauteng, Gauteng province. And I don't know if you remember at the time, it wasn't very long before people started talking about gangsters' paradise <laughs> rather than Gauteng province. And it seems as if Beth Avon is the same sort of thing. Okay? You talk about house of God, or we talk about house of wickedness. And so they were led astray. They led Judah astray. There was no knowledge of God in the land. And so God sums up like this. Ephraim is attached to idols. Leave them alone. When their drinking is over, they turn to promiscuity. Israel's leaders fervently love disgrace. How's that for a description of you? That you fervently love disgrace. Let no. it sink in. This is the case. God is a against Israel. Let's understand that first. And then realize that it's a similar case God makes against us. Mm -hmm. So what's the judgment? He makes it clear just in chapter 5 verse 2 as we make our way there. I will be a punishment for all of them. Mm -hmm. I will be a punishment. Mm -hmm. I find that quite striking. There's a lot of beliefs that God would never do anything horrible. Satan would, but not God. I'm not always sure that I see that in the Bible. There's no doubt that God allows Satan to do a lot of harm. But here it is. I will be a punishment for all of them. Let's have a look at that punishment. Let's look at it carefully. It's best summed up, I think, in verses 5 to 9. I'll read that to you. Israel's arrogance testifies against them. Both Israel and Ephraim stumble because of their iniquity. Even Judah will stumble with them. They go with their flocks and herds to seek the Lord, but do not find Him. He is withdrawn from them. They betrayed the Lord. Indeed, they gave birth to illegitimate children. Now the new moon will devour them along with their families. Blow the horn in Gibeah, the trumpet in Ramah, Raise the war cry in Beth Avon. There's that place again, house of wickedness. Look behind you, Benjamin. Ephraim will become a desolation on the day of punishment. I announce what is certain among the tribes of Israel. Let's look at this verdict carefully. Firstly, note that Israel and Judah's pride will be their own downfall. Verse 5, Israel's arrogance testifies against them. Mm -hmm. Have a look at verse 12. So I am like rot to Ephraim and like decay to the house of Judah. That word rot sometimes is translated like worm. Worm in your guts, in your intestines. It's that silent, from the inside, absolute decay, eating up, consuming of the nation. Slowly but surely destroyed from the inside out. One would think as that happens, desperate need to find some hope, they turn to God. Have a look at verse 6 again. They go with their flocks and herds, ostensibly to offer sacrifices. That's why you would go with your flocks and herds. To offer sacrifices to your God. He's still your God. To seek the Lord. But do not find Him. He has withdrawn from you. 
It's a prophet. Mm. There only is a, a nation of Israel because God was the God of that nation. And he says, I'll withdraw. That's it. I'm out. Checking out. You will not find me. You will look for me, but you will not find me. You will beg for me, but you will not find me. I've been here all along, but you pursued answers from pieces of wood. Not from me. You've looked for answers everywhere, but with me. Now you suddenly want me. Don't expect to find me. I'm no longer here. Next, the years will devour them. Their fields, their work, their product. Verse 7. They betrayed the Lord. Indeed, they gave birth to illegitimate birth, uh, children. Still, this issue of promiscuity and whoredom carries on. That's how God sees it. That's why He uses the analogy of adultery. He says, I was married to you, I was your faithful husband, and you chose every other possible source, possible man. Except me. So far that you've got illegitimate children. You've got illegitimate children. Now the new moon will devour them along with their fields. There will be nothing left of them. And he wraps that up with Ephraim will become a desolation on the day of punishment. As we come to the end of this, the only question on my mind, and I hope it's on your mind too, is there any hope left? Is that it? Is it? Is, is, then can we pack up now and go home and, you know, throw a party because there's nothing left for us. The new moon will devour us. Take our fields. Global warming's hitting. The world's coming to an end. Might as well party it up because there's no God coming to rescue me. As we come to the end of the chapter, I just want to read verses 14 and 15. For I am like a lion to Ephraim, and like a young lion to the house of Judah. Yes, I will tear them to pieces and depart. I will carry them off, and no one can rescue them. I will depart and return to my place until they recognize their guilt and seek my face. They will search for me in their distress. Sorry, my heart leaps, and I hope your does too, at the word until. Until? You mean there's something to come? There's another opportunity? Where? What? How? Until what? I need to know. I need to know. Because if my case is that bad before God, if I'm on trial, and the biggest trial in history, what's the until? What's to come? Well, I praise God, honestly, for the New Testament. Amen. First came John the Baptist. Let's listen to his message. Am I in the right place? Right. Then people from Jerusalem all Judea and all the vicinity of the Jordan were going up to him and they were baptized by him in the Jordan River confessing their sins. Confessing their sins. Let's just understand this. Israelites did not get baptized. Why would you? You're part of the people of God anyway. You were born there. Born into it. Guys who got baptized were those who were not part of the people of God. 
Because they wanted to become part of it. Well, there's certain things they should do. Uh, baptism was one of them. But not us. We don't have to do anything to become a child of God. We were born that way. I'm a Jew. That's what I am. And suddenly, Jews are getting baptized and confessing their sins. Confessing them. Confessing their sins. And we don't end with John the Baptist. These were the words of Jesus who came along. The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. The call has never changed. The call has been for us to repent. To stop chasing wooden idols. Or women. Or other men. Or whatever it is we chase. Because we are chasing sin. Doesn't matter what you believe, there's something you're chasing that's going to destroy you. It's going to do that. It will be the end. You will rot from the inside out. And if you don't get to the point where you say, God, I am so sorry, there is no hope left. That's what he's saying. Yeah. Repent. Repent and believe. That despite the fact that you're rotten to your core. Mm -hmm. I have done all that is needed to rescue you. Believe in me. Stop looking anywhere else. Stop looking for your hope, your happiness, your satisfaction, the things you want. Anywhere but with me. Unless you come to terms with me, says God. Jesus is the Son of God. Unless you come to terms with me, you will be left a desolation. Let's pray. Father God, this morning's reading, or at least this evening's reading, started with, hear the word of the Lord. So we've spent time in these chapters, and we've heard you. I pray, Lord, that we will repent and believe in your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.